Thanks to the organizers. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I chose a somewhat generic title, Stabilization in Algebraic Geometry, but I'll, I'll actually mean something very specific with this. Um, there will not be any Artin approximation in this talk, but there will be infinite dimensional geometry, which sort of justifies my presence here. So what happens quite often in, in algebraic geometry and also in applications of algebraic geometry is that you have a sequence of uh, embedded algebraic varieties, x1, x2, x3, etc. Um, and uh, you want to know whether for, for the index n sufficiently large, the equations of these varieties are similar. So for instance, what you, what you might think of is that xn is the, the variety of n by n matrices of rank at most 5, and then you see that for x1 there are no equations, for x2 there are no equations, for x5 there are no equations, but from x6 on there are determinantal equations and they all look sort of similar. Okay, so let, let me try to formalize that example, formalize and generalize that example, and then I'll give several examples where we can prove such stabilization uh, results. So the setting that I'll be looking at is the following, that you have some vector spaces, A1, A2, A3, over uh, ground field K, and maybe for simplicity, T, I'll assume that the field is infinite. And uh, these are related by some linear maps by one, which moreover are surjective, making my life very easy. So these are linear maps. And uh, these are just a risky closed subsets. Please remind me if I'm starting to write too small on the board. And of course, I'm assuming that these linear maps take this set into this set over here. So these diagrams commute. Um, OK. Now, uh, in that example that I mentioned, where, where, I, where I said n by n matrices of some rank, there is a group acting here. For, for instance, conjugation with with square mat with invertible matrices. So in, in addition to this setting, I'm going to assume that there are groups G1, G2, G3, etc., acting over here. So there are groups, and these are just uh, linear representations of these groups. And, uh, and I'm going to assume that these are, are sitting inside each other. So G1 sits in G2, sits in G3, etc. And then, of course, I want this to be compatible with the rest of the structure. So I want that uh, Gn preserves Xn, and I want that uh, pi n is Gn equivariant. Okay? I guess that's all. Um, right, in this setting, you can take a limit. So let's, uh, let's do that. So uh, first of all, I'm going to, limit, uh, to take the projective limit of these AN under these maps. So let me call this A infinity. And uh, these are, of course, finite dimensional vector spaces. I should have said that. But A infinity is not. It's an uncountable dimensional vector space. I mean, well, at least if these really grow. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can think of A infinity as, uh, as the dual of a countable dimensional vector space, which is the union over all a n star, um, where the union is taken by, you know, the 
inclusions corresponding to these surjections. And uh, so I'm going to think of A infinity as an infinite dimensional uh, affine space with a coordinate ring. Um, so let me write down what that coordinate ring is. If, if I call this, say, uh, this space T, then, uh, then this is just the same thing as the K homomorphisms from the symmetric algebra of T to K. Yeah, so the symmetric algebra is, uh, is the coordinate ring of A infinity. Okay, so l now let's look at, uh, at the, uh, the other pieces of the structure. So there's X infinity, which is uh, sitting inside A infinity, which is just the limit of roll N of Xn. And, uh, well, it's a, it's a closed subset of A infinity where you give A infinity the Zariski topology coming from this uh, from this algebra. So closed subsets of A infinity are given by polynomial equations in these infinitely many variables. So it's a, this is a closed subset and, and you can speak of the ideal of X infinity which is uh, just going to be the union overall N of the ideals of Xn uh, sitting inside this symmetric algebra a, a, ST which I called the coordinate ring of A infinity. Okay. Um, now, on both of these structures act the union of the GNs. So G infinity is just the union over all N of GN. And this acts on, uh, on X infinity and A infinity and K A infinity. Um, and, of course, it preserves this ideal. Okay, so now there are two questions uh, that I'll try to answer in, in some examples. The first one is uh, uh, the harder one, namely, is it true that, uh, that this ideal is, in fact, generated by finitely many orbits under G infinity. So you should think of this, this is an ideal in a polynomial ring in countably many variables. We'll see examples, in fact many of them in a minute. Uh, uh, is that ideal generated by finitely many orbits uh, of polynomials uh, under this group? So that's the harder question. The weaker question is that a corresponding set theoretic statement holds. So is um, X infinity uh, the zero set? So just uh, by this I just mean the, 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 the rational points over this field K uh, uh, is that topological space the zero set of uh, uh, finitely many orbits, so, say of G infinity applied to uh, I X N. You see, uh, I, uh, this this is uh, a union of all these ideals. So uh, any finite number is going to be in some X N for N sufficiently large. Yeah. So by by if the answer to this question is yes, then I'll call this say uh, ideal theoretic stabilization. And if the answer to this question is yes, then I call this uh, set theoretic stabilization. And of course, the first, an, a positive answer to the first implies a positive answer to the second. Okay. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Um, 
Let me see. You, may, you might have. To, that's a good question. Uh, maybe we should discuss about it later. There's a there's a theorem by Sergio Lang about wi which uh, which has Hilbert Nullstellensatz in uh, holds when the number of variables is smaller than the cardinality of the field or something. So so it, it, it's a little bit subtle, but uh, so I don't want to really go into that now. Sorry, we're speaking about finite dimensional Yeah. No, no. Uh, so by orbits, I mean orbits on polynomials. So, uh, yeah. So that's a, that's a very good point. So uh, this this is sitting inside the polynomial ring, and I mean orbits on poly. Yeah. No, not finitely. Exactly. So uh, that's right. So you have f1 up to fn such that the orbits of these under g infinity generate f. So is the question crystal clear? Okay. So let me do. Um, um, let me do uh, first a very basic example. Um, so here, a n is just k to the n, and uh, I will not yet say what x n is. Uh, no, no. Uh, that's a good. Uh, they will be in all the examples that I'll discuss. Yes, right. yeah. In fact, in many of the examples that are uh, that are discussed, there will be sections of the pies that uh, uh, that also preserve the axis, linear sections. So, but uh, it's not so important right now. So, um, so a a n is just k to the n, and the pi n takes. Uh, well, a point a1 up to a n plus 1, and just sends it to a1 up to a n. Right? So, uh, so what is a infinity? Well, it's just going to be k to the n, and, uh, and the coordinate ring of, k infinity, uh, of a infinity is just k x1 up to, well, not up to anything. <laughs> yeah, so it's x1, x2, etc. Um, so uh, now let me take g n equal to the symmetric group on n letters acting in the obvious way. Then, uh, then g infinity is uh, let's call it s infinity. It's the it's the finitary symmetric group, and it acts by permuting the variables over here. Um, okay, so. It does, in fact, uh, but, but they have the same orbits on polynomials. So, uh, since any polynomial involves only finitely many variables, uh, y you might as well take, take the symmetric group of n, but, uh, but this smaller group has the same orbit. So, it's okay. so, uh, so this acts by, by permuting all these variables, and, um, and so if you take any uh, xn say uh, uh, such that pi of xn plus 1 is contained in xn and uh, 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 gn stable, then, uh, then the ideal of x infinity is going to sit in this coordinate ring, x1, x2, me write down one more variable to sh suggest that there are indeed countably many, um, and uh, it is uh, s infinity stable. Now, uh, now there's a theorem which goes back to the 60s by Daniel Cohen, and it was rediscovered by uh, uh, Aschenbrenner, so Matthias. and Chris Hiller, which says that if you have any ideal sitting in this polynomial ring and it is uh, uh, stable under the infinite symmetric group, then in fact it's generated by finitely many elements. Uh, so,
Um, so that means uh, that the answer to the, to the harder question is yes in this case. So ideal theoretic stabilization holds here for any such x. And uh, if something like this holds for any such x, then I will call uh, this polynomial ring S infinity Noetherian. So let me, well, let me maybe give this as a separate definition. If you have a group acting on a ring, commutative ring with one by means of uh, automorphisms, and in fact, maybe, maybe not just a group, but, uh, but a monoid, acting by means of endomorphisms on the ring, then I'll call uh, R is G Noetherian. If, uh, well, if this holds, so. Uh, and there's a different way of saying that, so let me write that also down. So if every chain I1, I2 of G stable ideals stabilizes. So this is an algebraic notion of uh, Noetherianity, and of course there's a corresponding topological notion. So if you have a group acting on a topological space X by means of uh, homeomorphisms or a monoid acting by means of uh, continuous maps, then, uh, then X is called G Noetherian if every decreasing chain of G stable closed subset stabilizes. So, uh, so in particular, this, uh, this statement, this example over here shows that K to the N is S infinity Noetherian with the Zariski topology. Okay. Um, uh, there is, in fact, uh, example one prime, which uh, which is the same, but now um, uh, a n is k to the k times n, where k is fixed. So the coordinate ring of k a infinity is going to look like this x11, x12, dot dot dot, xk1, xk2, dot dot dot. And the symmetric group acts by permuting the columns of this k by infinite matrix. Um, and, uh, and again, this is uh, uh, S infinity Noetherian. And in fact, the way you prove this kind of statement is that uh, that you prove something stronger in which you break part of the symmetry. So let me, let me write that down as a remark here. Uh, this guy over here is not just S infinity Noetherian, but uh, uh, so K X I J, where uh, J runs through the natural numbers and I runs through the integers one through K is what I call ink n Noetherian, where ink n is a monoid. That's the reason why I said that G might be a monoid over here. So it's the set of all pi from n to n, <coughs> such that uh, pi i is less than pi i plus 1. Okay, so you, so you need to think a little bit about why this is a stronger statement than what I said over here. So let me do that. So, so first of all, it's clear how this acts, right? It, uh, maybe I should have written a J here because it acts on the, J, on the column index. Um, uh, so it's clear how it acts, acts. And it's also clear that uh, if you take any polynomial and you look at its orbit under the infinite symmetric group, then it contains the orbit under this, uh, under this ink n, because, uh, well, the polynomial involves only finitely many variables, and, 
and uh, what pi does on the other variables doesn't matter, so, so there is another pi which is in fact a finitary permutation which has the same effect. So, uh, so orbits under inc n are contained in orbits under s, s infinity, uh, and uh, so saying that, that any inc n stable ideal is in fact generated by finitely many inc n orbits uh, implies that the same holds for uh, s infinity. So why 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 is this? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, but uh, uh, this uh, this is in a sense bigger than this one over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, this is not a group, but uh, oh, no, 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 but a monoid. Yeah. But but the claim is the orbits under this monoid are smaller than the orbits under that monoid or group. <coughs> yeah, but it's stronger. So here, if yeah, okay, l l you are right. So. If you take an ideal that is s infinity stable, then it is inc n stable because the orbits are smaller here. Hence, from this statement, it follows it's generated by finitely many inc n orbits. Hence, certainly by finitely many s infinity orbits. That's the sequence of. Yeah. Um, so, so the reason why I wanted to say this is that uh, uh, this ha has a very nice sort of combinatorial proof, which is. Uh, in fact, it's, it's quite surprising. Um, I didn't write down the, 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 the years here, or not both of them, but uh, wait, I should have said, um, I should have said also uh, Hiller and Sullivan, who, who in fact proved this uh, version with K over here. Um, that, uh, that Daniel Cohen and Hiller and Sullivan and also Matthias found more or less the same proof for, for this statement as Cohen did 40 years earlier, namely um, uh, how do you prove such a statement? Well, by some, by some type of Gröbner basis argument you can restrict the, uh, your attention to monomial ideals uh, and to, to apply this Gröbner basis statement uh, type argument, you need, you need maps that do not, that preserve a, a monomial order. So you do not want to have uh, elements of the symmetric group, but rather increasing maps. And, uh, and then that, uh, co uh, that uh, well, for monomials, it's a combinatorial statement. And maybe I will not go into the details, but so first you reduce to monomial ideals, so that's uh, and uh, then it's a combinatorial statement, which is that uh, some partial order is a well partial order. This is also a way to prove uh, Hilbert's basis theorem. You reduce to monomial ideals and, and you apply Dixon's lemma, which says that, uh, that uh, n to, the, to some finite power uh, is well partially ordered with respect to uh, the component-wise order, which means that if you write down any sequence of exponent vectors, then there is one in the sequence and one further on, such that this one is component-wise less than or equal to this one. That's what it means to be a well partial order. Okay. Okay, so that, uh, that concludes examples one and one prime. Um, maybe, let me. You. So let me do example two, which in fact is going to be a non-example. Um, so now I'm going to take 
a equal to k to the n times n, and uh, pi of a i j, where i and j run from 1 to n plus 1, is just uh, the same matrix a i j, where i and j run from 1 to n. And uh, so, so a infinity is just k to the n times n, and uh, and g infinity, g n is still going to be the symmetric group, but now acting by means of conjugation. Um, and this space turns out to be not Noetherian. So, uh, Uh, yes, so, so Gn is Sn acting by conjugation on, uh, w by means of per uh, permutation matrices. So, uh, uh, so, so in fact that's the same as saying that pi xij is just uh, x pi i pi j. I always forget whether I need to put, no, I don't need to put the inverses here. That, that's just it. Sorry, what's that? I shouldn't call it pi because all oh, pi was my projection, and uh, oh, the, I had a pi there as well. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so why is this not Noetherian? Well, let me try to give you an a, 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 an example that does not stabilize. So uh, let's say we take x n is defined by. by the Sn orbit, in fact, orbits of the following monomials. So x1, 2, x2, 3, dot, 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 up to x k minus 1, k, and then x k 1, where k runs from uh, maybe 2 up to n. Okay. So in other words, if you look at your matrix and uh, uh, you look at the positions um, in a, say, a cycle in this matrix where, where the cycle has uh, length at least 2 and, uh, and at most n, because it's an n by n matrix, uh, then at least one of those entries must be 0. So then, uh, then you can write down a matrix, of course, mm -hmm. which lies in a n plus 1, so that means uh, k to the n plus 1 times n plus 1. And uh, this is a, is a, a zero of all these equations. So it's a zero of the ideal of xn, thinking of it as sitting inside the ideal of xn plus 1, uh, but not of i x n plus 1, because in i x n plus 1 you, you, you force that one of these entries are 0. So, um, so no set theoretic stabilization holds here, and also no ideal theoretic uh, stabilization, and this space is not Noetherian up to this action. Okay. Now you can uh, modify, so in this business, if you make the group that acts bigger, then it's more likely that the thing becomes Noetherian. So let it, let's make the group bigger. Um, you, you could try to make it bigger by taking two copies of Sn, one for each of the indices, but then it turns out to be still not Noetherian. So that's not good enough, but if you take two copies of GLn, then it's okay. So, uh, but with um, uh, say with Gn equal to Gln times Gln acting by uh, G comma H 
on the matrix A is equal to G A H inverse, uh, it is um, Noetherian. Um, say ideal theoretic stabilization holds. Um, that's not so surprising because uh, because what are the sub varieties of the of the space of n by n matrices that are stable under uh, under left and right multiplication if the field is infinite well they are just the varieties of matrices of of rank at most some given number and uh, that number might decrease in the sequence of xn's but at some point it cannot decrease anymore and that's where stabilization holds um, S n square? Yes. No. So S n times S n is not good enough. S n square. Oh, sure. Yes. S S of n square. Yeah, but that's like the. I don't know. It's a good question. Okay. So uh, we continue over here, maybe. Um, in fact, something uh, uh, more a general holds here. So let me let me state that as a so that's a theorem um, that in fact k to the n times n to any power is uh, GL infinity times GL infinity Noetherian. Uh, at least set theoretically. So that means as a topological uh, as a topological space. I didn't spend much time uh, spelling out what GL infinity is, but it's the union of of GL n for n running from one to infinity. Um, I don't know if this uh, statement is true ideal theoretically, and in fact it might depend on whether the field is characteristic zero or not. It might be a classical invariant theory that that works in characteristic zero, but, but not in positive characteristic. So, okay. Okay, so so far we had some sort of toy examples. Um, let me uh, start now by giving some more interesting examples. Hopla, that's the wrong one. You cannot push two of these buttons simultaneously. Oh, I could have pushed it by that, but now it's too late because I wanted to uh, oh, um, put that one up. Okay, would have been faster by hand. Okay, so let me start with an example that is not uh, my own, but it's very beautiful. So this is, uh, say, the mo A moduli space of points on P1. Um, so I need to tell you what A is and what X is, etc. So A n is going to be uh, k to the 2 n minus 1 double factorial. So that's 2 n minus 1 times 2 n minus 3, etc. Right? Um, and the coordinates are in bijection with uh, uh, partitions. of the numbers 1 up to n, uh, 1 up to 2n, in fact, into pairs. So unordered partitions into unordered pairs. There are so many of them, so that's why uh, this is it. And uh, xn is going to be the closure of uh, the image. Oh, this is a bit too... Uh, too long, so the image of phi n, where 
phi n is a map that takes a two times n matrix into uh, a point in this space. Uh, and I need to tell you what it does. So, uh, so phi of, uh, of a matrix, say B, is... Um, so I need to describe a point in this space, and for that I'm going to write down here the partition. So it's uh, I1 less than I2, comma, I3 less than I4, comma, etc. And then I need to tell you what that corresponding coefficient is. So that's going to be um, the product for j is 1 up to n of the determinant of this matrix B, which is a 2 times n matrix, um, at i2j minus 1, comma, i2j. So by this I mean I take the, these two columns of this matrix and I have a 2 by 2 uh, matrix, I take the determinant and I m multiply all those. Okay? So that's a, that's a polynomial map. So let me tell you what it has to do with the moduli space on, of points on P1. Well, if you think of the columns of this matrix as... P yes, sir? Yeah, so this is a 2 by n matrix and I take the columns with indices i to j minus 1 and i to j. So I take the, the column with these two indices and with these two, etc. And uh, I multiply all those uh, determinants. So why, what does this have to do with uh, moduli of, of points on P1? Well, suppose you have... Um, well, th this matrix, if all the columns are non-zero, at least, then... Uh, then they represent points on P1. And um, let's see, if you, if you scale one of these points with a certain number, then you will see that all of these coordinates get scaled by that same number. So, so in other words, as a pro say as a projective point, this is going to be well defined. Um, and if you apply, if you multiply this matrix B from the left with a 2 by 2 matrix, then all these determinants get multiplied by uh, the square of the determinant of that matrix. So in other words, this project projective point doesn't change if you act with GL2. So in other words, um, if you start with uh, honest points, uh, n, uh, sorry, there, there's something wrong here. There should be two n points on P1, and, uh, I, com uh, and I compute this image, then it's invariant under the action of GL2. Okay, so uh, so this image is uh, a moduli space of two endpoints on P1 in general. So it's one of the many GIT quotients of P1 to the two n that you can write down. But but it's a very nice one, and you can reduce others to this one using a trick. Um, so let me say what the stabilization is in this case. First, let me give you some equations to get a feeling for GL2. Yeah, it's P1 on which GL2 acts. Uh, oh, oh so, no, sorry. No, so the, uh, GL2 acts on, on this, but the group is going to, uh, that we will be interested in corresponds to permuting the point. So GN is going to be S2N. So let me say that right away. So PN is S2N. Um, yeah, and uh, well, first let me give some uh, equations for say n equal to two. So that means four points on P1. That's the first time there are moduli, the cross ratio. So uh, in that case, there are three partitions in of four elements into pairs, right? Um, and I'm going to draw those partitions by means of pictures. So here's one, two, three, four. Then this picture is one of the coordinates. It's a linear function on A2. And uh, here's another picture that's a linear function on A2. And here's another picture that's a linear function. And then we have all of them.
um, the coordinates on a n correspond to partitions of the numbers 1 up to 2n into pairs. Uh, I have partitioned the numbers 1 up to 4 into two pairs here, so that's one of the coordinates. This is another coordinate. And these are just the coordinates. These are the coordinate functions on uh, A2. And uh, um, if you evaluate these coordinate functions on a point in X2, then that means that you're thinking of this as a determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix times this determinant, <laughs> and here th uh, these two determinants, and here these two determinants. And then the classical Plücker relation says that this minus this plus this is equal to 0. So that's an e that is, in fact, the only equation for x2. Okay? So x2 is the zero set of this. Now let me also give you an equation. So uh, I should have said equation. So let me also give you an, e an equation for uh, n equals 4. So now we have eight points on the projective line. And again, I'm going to draw such pictures uh, for, the, for the coordinate functions. So um, uh, let me see. So I need to pair eight things into uh, pairs. So here's one coordinate function times this guy. And I claim that this is going to be equal at least up to maybe a sign that I don't want to worry about because it corresponds to flipping the order of these uh, uh, pairs. So it's going to be equal to the following. Yeah, why is it going to be equal? Well, if you multiply these two on a point that li lies on x4, then, uh, then you get uh, this determinant times this determinant times this times this times, uh, times these four. And if you do the same thing over here, you see that you have exactly the same determinant. Right? So uh, maybe uh, you have to take things <laughs> in the right order, but then there's a plus sign here. So the theorem, which is due to Howard, Milson, and I think this is double L, but I'm not sure. Um, Snowden and Vakil is that at least set theoretically these are on the only types of equations that you need. Um, let me state that a little bit more precise. So uh, for n at least 8, xn is defined at least set theoretically. Actually, they prove something more, but let me say it like this. Um, and I forgot what is the, there is maybe a condition on the characteristic of the field. Maybe the characteristic of k should be bigger than 3 or something, um, but I'm not entirely sure anymore. Um, this is defined by um, uh, the linear equations there. So uh, I, by, me, by which I mean that Plücker relation over there and simple binomial uh, uh, relations. And binomial equations as above. Um, so now I didn't tell you yet what pi is, these projection maps uh, from one to the other. Um, to, for, to, to phrase this uh, statement as a stabilization in the sense that I mentioned. So the corollary is that if you take pi n from uh, uh, a n plus 1 into a n, so remember here the coordinates are partitions of the numbers 1 up to 2n plus 2 into pairs, and here the coordinates are the 
the partitions of the numbers one up to two and into pairs. So there's a natural map that goes from here to here where you forget all the partitions where 2n plus 1 and 2n plus 2 are not paired. Yeah, so uh, by retaining only the partitions uh, containing... You mean yeah, just projecting. So this is a projection. And, uh, and I'm forget... So that means I... Um, I've, I, uh, I remember only these coordinates, and there are the right number of them. Yeah? And, uh, and then stabilization holds. So then set theoretic stabilization holds. Okay. Um, maybe I should explain wha why this map sets, sends xn plus 1 into xn, but it, it just corresponds to you take a 2n plus 2 tuple of points and you forget the last two points. Okay, okay so that's... Uh, the that's right, gn is, uh, is s2n. Okay, so that's the, the first non-trivial example, and I will not say anything about the proof. It's uh, sort of complicated. Uh, but I'll give another non-trivial example where, where, at least if I have enough time, I will say something about the proof. Um, so, so I guess this was example three, right? Yeah, but uh, but it's a it's a corollary of this theorem. But it's also it has its own long proof. That's what you mean. No, 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 oh, oh. no, no, no. I mean, th this is really it's almost equivalent. It's not quite equivalent, but it's almost equivalent to that. It's just I wanted to make sure that uh, that you see that it's uh, an instance of this setup that I had at the beginning. Okay, so uh, let me do example four. Um, which, um, yeah, so let me, what is example four? So this is uh, something that I'd like to call Plücker varieties. So let me say what that is. So first of all, let me give an example of a Plücker variety. Namely, if you look at the Grassmannian of uh, p-dimensional subspaces of a finite dimensional vector space V, um, then, uh, and you take the affine cone over this, then this sits in inside wedge P of V. And uh, this, this behaves well, in fact, uh, for, for reasons that will become clear in a sec second, let me put the P over here. Uh, this is functorial in V, Right, if you have a linear map from V to another finite dimensional vector space, then the wedge P of that map is going to map this Grassmannian into the other Grassmannian. And uh, it behaves well with respect to duals. Um, right, if you look at the map wedge PV into wedge NV, where the dimension of V, uh, sorry, this should be a V star, where the dimension of V is equal to P plus N, uh, then up to a scalar, there's a canonical isomorphism between this uh, space and this space. Then this is going to map GRPV in w with a, well, the cone over it into the GRN of V star. Yeah, this is just saying if you have a p-dimensional subspace of V, uh, then this is mapped to, the, to its annihilator, which is going to be an n-dimensional subspace of V star. Now, a Plücker variety is, is a rule that has these two properties. So, say x1, x2, x3, dot, 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 is a Plücker variety. Mm. 
Um, so, so this means that uh, xp of v is a Zariski closed subset of wedge p of v, and uh, and it satisfies these two properties. Say we call them one and two. Okay, so you might wonder, are there any other examples than just the Grossmannian? Um, but since both of these conditions are, are linear conditions, uh, you, you can do linear operations and create other examples. So uh, let me give an example of a Plucker variety. So, uh, so that's called the kth secant variety. of the Grassmannian. And uh, how is it defined? Well, x p of v is equal to, you take g r p hat of v plus dot 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 plus g r p hat of v, and you take this a risky closure. So in other words, you take k points, on, on the Grassmannian, you look at the, projectively, you look at the k minus one space spanned by those, and, uh, and you look at all the points that you get uh, by, by uh, varying these k points. So that's a bigger variety than the Grassmannian, and it is also an example of a, uh, of a Plucker variety. Oh, oh, I mean, uh, it's, uh, the Grassmannian is a projective variety sitting in the projective space of wedge P, and I just mean the affine cone over it. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, so now the statement is... Uh, so that's the theorem by... Uh, by my student Echermond and myself, which says that um, if you have a Plucker variety and it is small enough, which means that uh, x2 of v is not equal to wedge p, wedge 2 of v for v sufficiently large, then uh, um, then xp of V is defined by set theoretically by finitely many okay let me say types I mean orbits but I haven't specified the group yet so types of equations which is independent of P and V so in particular, that example shows, uh, this example of here shows that the kth secant variety of any Grassmannian is defined by uh, polynomials of some bounded degree, which, uh, which we don't know, those polynomials. So no one knows how to do this even for k equals to 2, but, uh, but at least we know that some finitely many uh, have this property. Okay, so, uh, so I have to put this into the framework that we've been studying. Ah, that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, uh, like this, there is a GRP and a GRN here. So, there, so uh, XP goes into XN, where N is the co-dimension. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, so that's a good point. So by, by that duality rela uh, condition, they, they are related to, to each other. In fact, let me, let me put it into the framework and then just stop. Um, so, so the way you do this is uh, you, uh, you take the following space, V, which, is, uh, which has basis x minus 2, x minus 1, x1, x2, etc. If you're a physicist, then you would rather use half integers here. 
Um, and uh, V n comma P is the subspace of, uh, of V n spanned by the first negative n negative ones and the first P positive ones. And now, instead of a one-dimensional diagram as I've had so far, there is a two-dimensional diagram depending on P and the co-dimension, so the dimension and the co-dimension. So what does that diagram look like? Well, let me first tell it in terms of coordinates and then dualize and say what, uh, what the A's are. So uh, you look at wedge P, V, N, P. Um, you can go into wedge P plus 1, V, N, P plus 1. And you can go into wedge P of V, N plus 1, P. And what you do over here is you take your tensor and you wedge it with x p plus 1, the new variable. And this is just the wedge p of the inclusion map from this guy to this guy. OK, so that's a, that's a diagram, a commutative diagram, in fact. So you can define something that's known as the infinite wedge of v, which, well, yeah, but. Uh, but it is because you do this for all p and n. So it's a two-dimensional, so you start at p and n equal to zero, so there's a big uh, first quadrant worth of, uh, of spaces with arrows between them. And that's, that diagram is obviously commutative. And the limit, so if you, uh, or the union if you want, these are injective maps, the union over all p and n of these spaces, wedge p, v, n, p, that is what people call the infinite wedge, or maybe the charge zero part of the infinite wedge. Now, uh, I still haven't told you, so here the arrows go the wrong way around, but that is because we've been doing this for the, uh, for the duals of the AN. So, uh, if you dualize everything, you're going to get wedge P of V n comma P star and maps wedge P plus 1, V n comma P plus 1 star and wedge P V n plus 1 comma P star. And then the two axioms that I wrote down for a Plucker variety uh, ensure that if you evaluate the Plucker variety at these things, so xp plus 1 uh, v n comma p plus 1 star and here you get xp of v n comma p star and here you get x uh, p of v n plus 1 comma p star that these maps uh, relate uh, these instances of the Plucker variety to, to each other so uh, so you take the limit now over both n and p, and then uh, this th the, the, the content of this theorem is that uh, at least set theoretic stabilization happens there. I was going to say something about the proof of that statement, but uh, I'm out, out of time, so thank you very much. We have to use this microphone oh, for I the questions. The question. so are there any questions or comments? Dorian? Well, uh, wait a second. But I don't see what I need. I no, but it's being recorded, so maybe it's oh, good if I on see. the I see. Okay, recording I, they know. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, uh, I was very interested to study some uh, non Assyrian rings many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I am hoping that your methods could help to study some uh, non-Assyrian rings. And I am thinking not to polynomial rings in uh, infinite variables, because this is an easy one. It is a union, sure. filtered union of, sure. of polynomials in finite variables. Mm -hmm. But let's suppose you are speaking about ultra power. Mm -hmm of a polynomial ring in two variables. Maybe it's interesting in one variable too, but 
let's say two, because one is much easier, probably. And I am thinking if you can get some, some, uh, um, some information about this non-Assyrian ring, ultra power mm -hmm. of a polynomial rings in, into variables. Of course, not now. Anyway, I don't believe that this will be a filtered inductive limit of smooth algebra or something mm -hmm. like this, because if this will be, then it could uh, follow strong approximation uh, property for some couples. And usually this is not true by an example of Spivakovsky. So I don't expect that the structure is good. But anyway, maybe you could find something. Yeah, so, so, so I guess for, for all of my methods, it's very important that there's a large symmetry group acting, right? I, I, uh, maybe I also for, for, for polynomials, you have a symmetry groups, and maybe mm -hmm. you yes. can uh, take a ultra power of symmetry yeah, groups or something which will group. act there. Okay. I, I don't know. I never was thinking, but, uh -huh. but maybe mm -hmm. you can find some things. Thank you. So, do you have a, a way of thinking of this k second variety also as a map, the closure of a map, like uh, like in the setting of of the moduli example that you gave from Howard and Vakil and Snowden? Um, well, I sort of wrote down the map here, right? So. Uh, 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 of course, if you, I mean, if you take some parameterization of these Grassmannians and then adding up, that is, a, that is, a, that is going to be, a, I mean, it's, a u it's obviously a unirational variety. You can write down even in the, yeah, so you have to watch out a little bit. But I think even in the infinite dimensional setting, you can write this down as a sort of uh, polynomial map. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, in any case, we don't have too much time. So we are assuming three minutes. Okay, thanks. <laughs>